Some would say the 1956 movie, The Conqueror, was cursed from the beginning. It had a terrible script, an unhappy crew, and a producer in Howard Hughes who would soon lose his mind to an obsessive-compulsive disorder and any number of other unknown mental challenges. Within two years, he quit wearing clothes or cutting his nails and would eat only three different foods, chicken, chocolate, and milk. Hughes quit bathing and bought every copy of The Conqueror for the modern-day equivalent of $120 million. In order to punish himself for the commercial and critical flop, he sat alone, watching it on repeat, naked in his chair, while peeing in mason jars. Reviewers really hated this movie, and audiences hated it too. It barely broke even at the box office, and is almost universally considered one of the worst movies of all time. How would you feel if Jonah Hill were cast as Martin Luther King Jr.? That's pretty much what happened here. John Wayne played Genghis Khan, and it was as bad as you're imagining. Pretty much everyone who worked on this movie left it feeling embarrassed. Nobody got rich, nobody was proud of it, or brilliant in it. And then a few years later, people started dying. Director Dick Powell died in 1963 at age 59. Co-star Pedro Armanderas died that same year, age 51. The following year, John Wayne himself developed the lung cancer that would recur to the end of his life before killing him in 1979. It was about this time that people began to realize the curse of the Conqueror was real. The land that Hughes had chosen for the location of this film near the town of St. George, Utah, was the site of radioactive fallout. The U.S. government had been testing nuclear weapons about 150 miles northeast of St. George, and local wind patterns had covered this part of Utah in radioactive dust. According to Nevada historian Richard Marino, by 1981, 91 of the Conqueror's 220-member cast and crew, including all of the principals, had developed some form of cancer, and more than half of those had died. In 1953 alone, the equivalent of 20 Hiroshima's had dropped in this testing area, and most of the fallout headed to St. George. An off-site radiation monitor for the Atomic Energy Commission was assigned to measure radioactivity in the area, and the needle literally left the dial. But when this tester reported these findings to authorities, he was instructed not to say anything because the government didn't want to be liable for paying damages to ranchers or residents. According to Marino, in April and May of 1953, ranchers noticed burns on the skins, faces, and lips of sheep that had been eating grass and later proved to be radioactive. Ewes began miscarrying in large numbers, and wool literally fell off the sheep in big clumps with visible blisters underneath. Some lambs were stillborn and had what has been described as grotesque deformities who were unable to nurse because they were so sickly. An estimated third of the 18,000 to 20,000 sheep in the region died. Additionally, within five years of the tests, there was a jump in the number of people diagnosed with leukemia and radiation-related cancers in the residents of southern Utah, southeastern Nevada, and northern Arizona, all downwind of the detonations. Towns with little history of childhood leukemia suddenly had clusters of children suffering from the disease. The government denied everything. To Hugh's credit, he had asked the Atomic Energy Commission if the area was safe for filming. They told him yes. I sat down with Richard Marino to learn more about this overlooked and completely unnecessary tragedy. This is an interesting story. Basically, in the late 1940s, Dick Powell, who was a fairly well-known Hollywood movie star, actor, but also director, he was, had commissioned a script for a movie called Genghis Khan. And they had received the script and he was planning to do this movie. And when they wrote the script, they did it in kind of this 
quasi Shakespearean tone because they wrote it for Marlon Brando, thinking he was this hot young star that was coming up that he would be ideal for this. At the same time, Dick Powell takes a meeting with John Wayne, biggest movie star in the world, Westerns, cowboy image, etc. For those of you who may not know, Marlon Brando is an actor's actor, a versatile thespian of the highest order. John Wayne basically plays the same character in every movie. He's a grizzled old American cowboy of one kind or another. John Wayne talks to Dick Powell. They were friends. And uh, he said that he was looking for something different. He didn't want to keep making the same movies over and over. And he saw this script for Genghis Khan on top of the desk. And so Wayne picked it up, apparently, flipped through, read it, and said, I want to do this. Well, it was not written for him. And anyone who's seen the movie that subsequently came out knows it's terrible. John Wayne trying to do a quasi-Shakespearean dialect is just not going to work very well. But he was the biggest, I guess today, Tom Cruise wants to make a movie. Tom Cruise gets to make a movie. Nobody said no to the Duke. And so they went forward, got the studio to buy into it. They hired Susan Hayward to to be the leading lady, Agnes Moorhead, to I think play her mother, only because they both had red hair, and a whole variety of other actors. And they decided the best place to film this movie, Genghis Kong, to make it look like, and, and actually it was called The Conqueror, the film, to make it look like it was, you know, the, the Gobi Desert, was to film it somewhere in Utah or Nevada. And so they picked a place right near St. George, Utah, where there were a lot of sand dunes and it kind of resembled the steppes, I guess, that, that you would find in, in Mongolia. And they decided to film there. One of the things about filming there, in, in the, now that we're in the, ni- the early 1950s, when they're doing this, is that this is a period when Nevada is also doing a whole bunch of above-ground atomic bomb testing and nuclear bomb testing. And, of course, nobody really understood all of the, the dangers that were involved with doing those kind of testing. To digress a bit, it, it, there are photos where... The casinos in Las Vegas in the late 40s and early 50s would advertise, come stay in the room at the hotel because at daybreak, they're going to blow up a nuclear bomb and you can go outside, put on, we'll put chairs out and you can watch uh, the mushroom cloud. And it was a tourist attraction at that time. And so there really was no perception that this was something that was bad or dangerous or would have any potential health impacts. And certainly the people that lived in that area didn't realize that either. So they had apparently done some a series of nuclear above ground, like atmospheric tests prior to when they were going to film this movie. And that whole area had been blanketed with uh, fallout. And so movie crew shows up, they're told it's safe. They start doing things. And of course, because they want this to look like the Gobi Desert, They bring in massive industrial fans. So there's, think to yourself, what's the worst thing you could possibly do if you've got fallout that's fallen on everything is kick it up with fans. So they created dust storms for the movie and all these actors and the crew and everybody's breathing this stuff in. They're getting it all filled with them, all their clothes and everything has got all this sand and dust in it. And they finish the film. Dick Powell decides they have to do some reshoots. So they actually truck a whole bunch of this sand into California and use it for the reshoots for the movie. So, you know, the act of then kicking it up with bulldozers and bringing it and then dumping it somewhere. And so as a result, they call it the Conqueror's Curse because of the name of the film. An inordinate number of people in later years came down with cancer. Now, most of them were pretty heavy smokers. So, um, you know, the the direct line between I made a movie in Utah and it gave me cancer is a little hard to prove because there were other factors. But certainly smoking and being exposed to certain radioactive particulates is not a good combination for your health. And so uh, if you look at the statistics, it's something like over 31 percent of the people who were involved in making that film died of cancer in later years. Now, not right away, but John Wayne, he had lung cancer. 
He always, from what I could read, he never said it was the conqueror's curse. He always said it was because he was a four pack a day smoker. And even after he lost one lung, they removed it because it was cancerous. He continued to smoke. And kind of an interesting side note, his last movie was also made in Nevada, which was um, The Shootist and filmed in Carson City, Nevada, where he was already dying. And it, it's a good movie, but kind of an interesting postscript to all of that. Susan Haywood had brain cancer and died in her late 50s. And Agnes Moorhead died in her early 70s, and she had cancer. She's one I found a quote, I think it was in People magazine, where they interviewed her about this. And, and she said, yeah, it was the damn movie. <laughs> Basically, she blamed the film and said that's what gave her cancer. But there were just numbers of people, people who worked on the set, the sound people, et cetera, who were all exposed to this. And again, there was a lawsuit that one of the extras, I think, filed, and it never went anywhere. But we know that exposure, particularly long-term exposure to those, to, to the fallout is not healthy. And they're actually, the people who live in that St. George area did sue years and years later. And they were able to um, get a congressional settlement where there was a, a pot of money set aside to, to pay for them, for their medical needs, et cetera. I, I actually know a guy who I think he's still alive. He worked not so much on the, they call the people there in the St. George area, the downwinders, because the fallout was all blown in their area. He actually worked on the Nevada test site, but it was in the 60s before, the, again, they knew, and he's in his 80s now, and he still gets tested every year. Somebody from the government says, oh, you got to come in for your regular test, and they test him to see if he's got cancer or anything else. So I think it's because of these, this congressional action in the 1980s that the government finally responded to this. But in the beginning, they denied everything. And they said, no, there's nothing unhealthy. And you had with the downwinders, uh, a lot of the, that St. George area, which is now kind of a resort area, but that used to be a lot of sheep and cattle. And you had immediately in the years right after the fallout occurred, they had all kinds of problems with sheep, with uh, lots of their babies were being born dead, some with deformities, some with the burns all over their body from the fallout. So it really did have a, a serious impact on the folks who live in that area in St. George, which is right on the Nevada border, kind of near Mesquite. Do you know if people started realizing it in those communities in terms of noticing that the cancer and stuff was higher or did people notice that the, the movie stars and the people who were acting and, and being on set were being impacted first? Do you know which no, one? No, I don't think first? so. I think the people that live there started noticing. I, I read there were cancer clusters, children being born with cancer. And so, yeah, I, I believe they were kind of independent. I think the movie came out later as far as like the connection. I'm not sure people thought about they filmed that movie in St. George, Utah. But the people who live there had to live with it every day. And they started seeing these higher incidences of, of cancer, clusters of cancer. And so that was all part of what I, they did try to sue at one point and they, and the government won, said they proved that, of course, this is in the sixties, that there was no damage to them. But it was years and years later that the congressional delegation responded to the, the reality, which is yet yeah, something is not right here. And so there was, a, there was actually congressional action to set up a fund to, to pay for the needs of these folks. And I think to make them as, as whole as they could. And I believe the fund grew to be over a billion dollars at, at one point. One of the saddest things about this tragedy is that we will never know the full scope of the Conqueror's curse. As those 60 tons of radioactive dirt were taken back to Hollywood and undoubtedly remain there after decades of exposing yet another population of people. The lives of people of St. George, the so-called downwinders, are of course no less valuable or important than the cast of The Conqueror. But without this movie, their story might never be told. In 1990, President George H.W. Bush signed the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act into law offering compensation for people affected by nuclear testing. According to the Atomic Heritage Foundation, the government initially only expected several hundred applicants. 
this turned out to be a massive underestimate. As of April 20th, 2018, 34,372 claims have been approved for a total of 2243205380 dollars Nevada site downwinders have fared better than some other downwinder communities in this respect, some of whom are still seeking compensation and recognition. Like the radioactive fallout itself, the legal, financial, and medical trauma of this reckless use of nuclear power will last for generations. As this article points out, noting that the time that elapsed between the test and financial compensation often meant that downwinders died before they received their benefits. Furthermore, the children and grandchildren of many Nevada site downwinders continue to claim that they too have major health complications due to the radiation they or their older relatives experienced. These include mental and physical disabilities at birth, as well as pre-existing conditions that show symptoms earlier in childhood than normal. Litigation concerning these cases is ongoing. Underground testing at the Nevada testing site lasted all the way to 1992, and as a result, these remain some of the most radioactive land areas in the world. And while second and third generation victims of fallout have filed many claims for compensation, not one of them has won their appeal. They continue to fight on. <laughs> 